Hey everybody, what's good, Classic City? Welcome to another episode of AthCast. I am your host, Matt Pulver, joined again by Chris Dowd of Athens Politics Nerd. Let's get it started. I want to be quick here at the very top, not a whole lot to say, except that our featured panelist for the news roundup a little bit later had to cancel at the very last minute. So unfortunately, it's just me and Chris, but we will get into the local news and politics of the day like we always do. But before that, I'm going to, for better or for worse, say a little bit about the murder of Lake and Riley. The tragic death of Lake and Riley has shaken Athens and the UGA community. But the matter has immediately become politicized by some in the Republican Party who see it as an election year weapon. Within hours of the suspect's identity becoming known, namely his status as a Venezuelan undocumented resident, Republicans picked up the issue as a means to attack Democrats from top to bottom, from President Biden in Washington and Congress all the way down to the local level here in Athens, specifically District Attorney Deborah Gonzalez, who faces what some see as a very difficult race ahead of her to gain re-election as the county's top prosecutor. That word, prosecutor, is what's at the heart of the attacks on Gonzalez. Republicans say that she's not doing enough of that. She's not doing enough prosecuting. But Gonzalez was elected District Attorney in 2020 on a platform of reducing the number of citizens needlessly swallowed up by the criminal justice system, especially black and brown citizens. The United States, of course, incarcerates more of its citizens than basically any country on Earth, far more severe than Russia, China, Iran, or any of those countries that are typically held up as authoritarian states. And Gonzalez was voted into office on a promise to disrupt this process of mass incarceration of our citizens, especially racial minorities and poor folks. In concrete terms, that meant, for instance, a refusal by D.A. Gonzalez to prosecute low-level drug possession charges, most notably on marijuana. There's no need to send poor Americans into the system of incarceration and state supervision for having a quarter of marijuana on them or, or even a small quantity of other drugs meant for personal use. Not for distribution or sale or trafficking, but just for personal use. It also meant Gonzalez's office not seeking the maximum sentence for a good many charges and an array of other prosecutorial rules to minimize the number of citizens having their lives unnecessarily ruined by the system. Republicans at the state level immediately began attacking Gonzalez, like day one, and last year even crafted a whole new state-level district attorney oversight and disciplinary commission basically tailored for Gonzalez. That commission was given the power to fine, discipline, and ultimately remove DAs that they didn't like, or that didn't prosecute severely enough. Again, this law was designed, this commission was designed basically for Gonzalez alone. That was how unsettled they were by her. Gonzalez, for her part, has begun her re-election campaign unapologetically or even defiantly holding to that same message that brought her to office nearly four years ago. She spoke to the athens Clark County Democrats on February 22nd, and Athens Politics Nerd was there to capture the event. With election season underway, you'll be able to find candidate speeches, interviews, and more at AthensPoliticsNerd.com and at APN's YouTube page. Here's some of that speech by D.A. Gonzalez to local Democrats. I've never changed. I have told everybody on my platform what I was going to do, and guess what? I'm doing it. And again, I'm being sued. And there are bills out there to get me out. Why? Because I've done exactly what I said I was going to do. And it didn't matter what they were going to do to me. I was going to get up every day and fight that fight. Right? When the Dobbs decision was overturned, I was one of the first days to go out there and say, what? I pledge that I will not prosecute a woman or her doctor for pursuing reproductive medical rights. This is a system, the criminal legal system that has been in place for generations and has oppressed who? Black, brown, and poor people. And they've been doing it for years. And how do I know that I am um, fulfilling that second mandate? Well, they're suing me. (laughs) <laughs> They're changing laws in the legislature to get rid of me. 
right? And how do you know your strength? You know your strength by the size of the weapons that they use against you. And now the Lake and Riley murder has amplified those attacks to a degree that no one could have imagined even a week ago, two weeks ago. Representative Houston Gaines, who represents part of Clark County in the state legislature, put the crosshairs immediately on Gonzalez. He took to social media to charge that Gonzalez, on her first day in office, announced that she would, quote, take into account collateral consequences to undocumented defendants before deciding whether to charge criminals. Regarding the suspect in the Lake and Riley murder, Houston Gaines also points out that, quote, the suspect and his brother were cited in athens Clark County on October 27th for shoplifting. The suspect had an outstanding bench warrant in athens Clark County as of December 20th for failing to appear in court on those shoplifting charges, end quote. That, of course, has nothing to do with the murder. But that won't matter to Houston Gaines and other Republicans who will use this awful tragedy to accomplish what they've been trying for more than three years now, to remove Gonzalez from office. Yes, the Lake and Riley suspect was cited for shoplifting, but he was expected to appear in court on those charges. He was charged. But we don't put everybody who's charged in jail indefinitely or until their court case. It's not the way it works. It's not feasible. Our jail is not big enough to lock up every single shoplifter or petty criminal until their court dates with no bail. I mean, we'd have to, I, I don't know, change course and, and turn the old mall into a gigantic jail for something like that. And Houston Gaines is implying that all shoplifters should be locked up lest they murder someone. Or maybe he's implying shoplifters of a certain race. Put simply, these attacks on D.A. Gonzalez are absurd. And they're probably going to continue. They're probably going to get louder even. And they'll all be founded on this notion that a district attorney should have seen a shoplifter. One petty criminal among countless in a county as big as Clark County and just locked him up, I guess, indefinitely because you somehow know magically that he might potentially be a murderer. The murder of Lake and Riley has shocked us all. It's just awful. It's unthinkable. It's just a tragedy, but it doesn't have to be political. Just because it's an election year, why are you treating her like a football? You're trying to score points off of this poor woman and her family. It should be better than that. Today, we'll be discussing what went down in City Hall last Tuesday at the agenda setting session and giving you all a few quick updates on more general matters being discussed right now. On the docket for today, we have Athens finally going through with reparations for black Athenians or as close as we can get to that within the bounds of state law. Also, a big property acquisition by the ACC government that signals big changes coming to downtown and the continuation of a process I think that will very substantially expand downtown for the first time in easily more than a century. And we'll also be discussing an ambitious effort to make our roads safer and the return of traffic circles. We're just going to get traffic circle after traffic circle. Uh, t time is a, is a flat traffic circle. But before that, time for a few quick updates. The local government is in the middle of revising its Memorandum of Understanding with Piedmont Athens Regional regarding emergency medical services. We don't know what's in the new MOU yet, because it hasn't been made public, but what it might include is a requirement for National EMS, that's our for-profit ambulance company here in town, to give regular updates on their performance to the mayor and commission. This has been called for by public safety advocates for about 10 years now, because they question whether EMS response times in Athens are up to national standards. National EMS has never shared their raw response time data with the public. Here's an update on something we covered last time, the ban on Airbnbs and other short-term rentals. There's not a whole lot to report, except that the ordinance is now under consideration in committee. Or, well, consideration is, is too light a word. It's under some, some construction or, or renovation in committee. 
It was discussed by that committee on February 19th, and staff and the commissioners on that committee were assessing and and trying to sort of gauge the vulnerability of this new law to lawsuits, especially that sunset provision, which was so central to the debates at City Hall. The main takeaway, though, from that committee meeting is that they have contracted with the firm that will provide the software to track and monitor short-term rentals. And that company says that the raw list of all Clark County short-term rentals will be in the hands of ACC staff by February 29th. And then that list will be divided into properties that are legally conforming and and those that are non-conforming. And that process is expected to take two, three weeks. So by mid-March, we should have what we've never had before, a a list of all the short-term rentals, Airbnbs, Verbos, all that in Clark County. And then those that are free and clear, those that are conforming with the law, and then those that are non-conforming. Now, it's a little unclear what happens to this law after it leaves committee. I've heard that it goes to the planning commission. I've heard it goes to the planning department. I've heard it goes back directly to mayor and commission. I think the long and short of it is that it's going to take longer than we would like. It's on sort of a, a winding road to eventually, eventually becoming the law of Clark County. With a prospective judicial center still a ways off, athens Clark County is slated to purchase properties at 440 College Avenue due to severely cramped quarters in the courthouse and the various staff offices around town. What began as a $70 to $80 million project, approved by voters as a SPLOS project in 2020, the prospective judicial center has now ballooned to a price tag of $140 million, and we just ain't got that kind of money. But here's the thing. When I tell you that the courthouse is beyond full, I mean that every single office, judge, court, department, you name it, is squeezed into a shoebox. According to the last count, the existing courthouse is short 99,000 square feet of space in order to operate properly and, and safely. They are really, really crammed in there. And then there's the athens Clark County government staff offices. Remember, they're like, I don't know, close to 2,000 employees of Clark County government. And every single department needs space. So, under the most optimistic plan, this new judicial center Athens voters endorsed in 2020 would replace the courthouse with something large enough for a modern courthouse and provide office space, or at least some office space, for Clark County government departments all squeezed into these buildings across town. The county would eventually like to unload some of those properties, like the Doherty Street Governmental Building and the Governmental Building on Sedula Avenue, and place those offices and departments in a modern space. Now, while it is genuinely terrible that this Judicial Center's price tag has just exploded from 70 some odd million to $140 million, the good news is that this stopgap purchase of office space on College Avenue for some of those courthouse functions will be funded with unallocated funds that we have, mostly by interest that we've earned on American Rescue Plan or ARPA money that we invested. So it's sort of money that's a windfall from a windfall, right? We got millions of dollars from the federal government through ARPA, the American Rescue Plan, during COVID. And now we have $2.5 million in interest from those funds. So, I mean, it's low-key free. Did you say that the cost has doubled on the new courthouse? It has almost doubled. Now, now, part of that is due to construction inflation. We're no stranger to that now. But the size of the building has also increased. Remember, this was something that was started to be thought about in 2018, I believe, ahead of that 2020 SPLOST vote. And the size of the county government and the size of of the courthouse offices has expanded such in in these intervening years that I think they need maybe 30,000 more square feet than they thought they would. Hmm. So the purchase of the properties at 440 College Avenue, which if you're familiar with the corner of Doherty and College Avenue, it's those brick townhouses. And one of those units is already being used by the public defender's office. So there's a a, a little bit of kismet there. And that would be sort of uh, what what Mayor Gertz called a way station. It's a way to let off some of this pressure uh, in in these offices, especially at the courthouse, while we uh, search 
couch cushions or whatever for the other 70 million we would need to, to build a, a proper judicial center. And the public defenders, they're not getting kicked out, right? They're going to get to stay there. It is my understanding that they are. And I know Commissioner Houle uh, inquired into this and, and maybe Commissioner Davenport also. And the word seems to be that they would stay put and they would be joined by other judicial fellows. Um, if you've ever been to the courthouse, I mean, can we talk about the courthouse for a second? It's, it's madness in there. It's, it's, there's so much going on. There's so many, it feels like you're in a literal Kafka novel or like an MC Escher drawing or something. I, at least for me, like heaven forbid you come in through a door, like you show up and you're like, oh, you can't go through the front door. Now you have to go to the back door or vice versa. And it's like, well, how do I get to the place? There's stairs or elevators. I'm baffled by the place. But the bigger problem is that you have things that are really untenable in a courthouse. You have juries, entire jury pools lounging around hallways, you know, while they're waiting, you know, to be sent this place or that and mingling with defendants and plaintiffs. I mean, there, there have been situations described where you have literally a, a, a jury, a defendant and a plaintiff all in the, the same hallway because there's not a place for them to go. That sounds like a potential security issue. A, a real big security issue. We've heard stories of inmates or defendants being shackled to, to benches in the hallway. It's just, it's packed to the actual gills. And so we need we need some place to uh, to have it expand to a proper courthouse. Former Commissioner Russell Edwards pointed out that when the when the building was built in 1914, we had one superior court judge, and now we have four. To say nothing of all the other types of courts that have sprung up over the years, so it is just it's beyond it's beyond full, and every municipal office is also beyond full. So we need to build something that can house everyone, but we don't have the money for it. Now, there is one option that, that, might, that might be more affordable because we don't have to pay for land. We don't have to buy the property. And these are two parking lots directly across the street from this property at 440 College. That's the county-owned parking lot in front of the Indigo Hotel and Another parking lot, again, county owned across College Avenue from that. It's in the shadow of one of those student condo developments um, on the Bethel side of college. And those properties total almost two acres, which make them maybe feasible for this project, which would require around two acres. And there's no other property that really works that we have available to us. And most of the other properties that we do have available to us or that are that are on the long list of, of sites under consideration are places like the Piggly Wiggly on North Ave and, and some other privately owned properties. And then among the county owned properties, no no property really jumps out as as a likely candidate outside of maybe where the where the jail is. That would make some sense. But but you can't feels like you can't very well have a courthouse clear out Lexington Road. That that feels distant to me. It does. Although maybe not if you live in the east side, which a lot of people do. Right? The, the, hey, the east side is always clamoring for, for more stuff out there. <laughs> Could toss them a courthouse maybe, but that's not exactly what they, what they want. <laughs> They're like, we wanted a library. <laughs> um, the original size of the building... Uh, in 2018, that was voted on by voters for the SPLOS project list in 2020, that was 142,000 square feet. That is now ballooned to 172,000 square feet. So that explains some of that increase in cost. But again, I think most of it is due to just the construction inflation that we're seeing. And where are we going to get the money for all of this? I don't know. And I also don't know what happens with a SPLOS project that is approved. And those, And there are, you know, a set number of dollars that are that are earmarked for that w what do you do if you can't make up the difference now one thing that they are talking about more seriously now it seems like and something that they'll i think something that they'll have to seriously consider is a phased option 
where they build something that's affordable and build the rest later. But that's also not ideal because then you're sort of, you're not building the, not building the whole thing at one time likely means that some of the, some of the considerations that, that you have to make for a building of that sort get, get lost. So it's tough to know what they're going to do because uh, we severely need it, but we simply can't afford that. I mean, we can't just start borrowing money for every SPLOS project. Although I, I do know what happens if a SPLOS project is found to be infeasible. Um, in, in that case, the Marin Commission can decide to kick it back to the voters who can then vote to refund that money as property tax relief. So that is an option, I guess. But I think we do really need this new courthouse. Okay, that that's interesting. Okay, yeah. And I think there are no small number of, of Athens voters who would say, yeah. Yeah, some people really might like that, actually. Yeah, but that's, that's really penny-wise and pound foolish because the money that we would get kicked back per homeowner is very small. And we desperately need, we've been needing a, a judicial center slash municipal center of this sort for, for a long time. So it's, it seems very unwise to pursue that. But at the same time, I, I don't know, I don't know what we do. Now, an, another aspect of the properties that I mentioned earlier, the, the Indigo or not, not the, not the, not the parking lot of the Indigo Hotel, but the, the, the one out in front, the, the one out in front, yeah. right. Is that that would be the, the second instance of Clark County sort of crossing that invisible border on Doherty and doing what Athens city leaders have been thinking about for God, more than a century, expanding downtown, down college. And I think a courthouse would be a very proper anchor, right? To accelerate that expansion out there. Uh, the, the, the charm facility down at the very end of college has also been discussed. Um, and that I think maybe would accomplish the same uh, the same aim that I'm talking about. And, and That's a little further to walk for the lawyers who want to get lunch after, after the case, right? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> they well, probably won't do that. <laughs> well, and that's a real consideration. When they talk about site selection, they're talking about, you know, um, walk time, drive time, um, you know, among, among facilities. I mean, that, that's a real consideration. I, in addition to, you know, the, the lawyers being able to eat lunch, yeah. There is one final sort of, and this might be sort of a moonshot, site for the center would be the federal building that Mm. bizarre granite building that nobody has ever been in (laughs) have have you ever been in there no do you know anybody who's been in there no i do not right i think the fbi is in there i think there actually is an fbi office office in my mind it's it's just filled with FBI agents. (laughs) but in any case it's federal it's federal land it's federal property that entire block is federal land as as I understand it. So we would have to work out some manner of like land swap in order to, you know, if they were to agree to give up that property, I can't imagine anything real important. I don't know. I'm, I'm being super ignorant right now, but like what is happening in that building that makes it so valuable to the feds? I I, I have no idea what goes on there. I'll be honest. Yeah. Except for the bureau. Um, But Mayor Gertz has spoken with at least uh, Representative Mike Collins about the potential of of, uh, moving on to that property uh, or or, or athens Clark County acquiring that property. Um, I want to say, although I don't know for sure, that the offices of of Senator Ossoff and or Warnock have also been reached out to about that. So that is that is a possibility. It's a property that is doing a whole lot of nothing. So it'd be nice if we, if we got it just for, just for better uses. Yeah. But, but, but that's, but again, that, that's an outside possibility and and who knows. In other news, the commission is set to approve a program to help first time home buyers with their down payments as recommended by the Athens Justice and Memory Project. First American Bank will run the down payment assistance program and they'll get $718,000 from the American Rescue Plan to do it. With the money, First American says they can provide $25,000 at 0% interest to 35 families with low or moderate incomes in certain majority black census tracts. 
Once these loans are paid off, First American can make the same offer to a new set of families. Some additional money might be available from the State Department of Community Affairs to help these families as well, because $25,000 might not fully cover a down payment in Athens anymore. This is part of the local government's ongoing commitment to reparations for the harm they caused during the urban renewal period of the 1960s. Families in Linentown, for example, were underpaid by about $5 million for their homes when that neighborhood was destroyed. So Matt, uh, 0.7 million down, but they've got a ways to go, don't they? Yeah, they got a long way to go. Now, in in their defense, the gratuities clause, and and maybe let's I'll t- I'll take a break to uh, explain the gratuities clause. It's a it's part of state law that is designed to forbid kickbacks and other sorts of frauds. You can't give money per state law. You can't give money directly to citizens without getting something in return, like which, an actual transaction. Which makes sense. It does make sense. No, it's 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 a perfectly valid law f- for fraud reasons, but most municipalities in Georgia are scared to death of it because it also ends up capturing any means of reparations or or or, or just cash disbursements. You can't give cash to citizens. Uh, but this is federal money, so actually the, the state uh, gratuities clause doesn't apply here. Yes, exactly. Right. But again, I don't know, even with the ARPA money, it, it still feels like an open question if you can if you can give it directly to citizens. Well, they're giving it to the bank first, and then uh, they're to run this program, which I think I think it's totally legit as far as legally. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, I, I, I agree that it. Every, everybody has has uh, agreed that it that is legal. Um, but I, I, I guess I wonder if they are going through the bank. I guess my question is why they're going through a bank. Well, uh, th- there was an RFP uh, process that they they uh, set out, and uh, the bank just gave uh, the best proposal according to s- staff in uh, HCD. Okay, right. That jogged my memory. Yes, it. I think like East Athens Development Corporation. I think yeah, was on. Yeah, they were was... one of the applicants. And uh, First Americans. Uh, the big thing about First Americans' proposal was that the the overhead costs were were just super low. And I, in my mind, I kind of think like, okay, well, they're doing this for profit, so. Um, they, they don't want to sell homes. So I think that's why they're able to give a lower overhead than, than maybe some of these nonprofits would. Yeah. But, but yeah. still, that's, that's a great thing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're, they're already built for distributing money in that way. Right. So right. yeah, so, the overhead is super, super low. And if we could just get that 25,000 figure, maybe raised to 30 or so, that might, I think, really optimize this program. But like you, but like the question you asked initially, uh, this is uh, only a start um, in, a, in a just world, in a just future. This is the beginning of repairing mm-hmm. damage. This is not uh, and should not be considered the the end mm-hmm. of that well, debt. <laughs> they did give about $500,000 to Historic Athens uh, last year for home repair of some of these historic homes, uh, especially those you know owned by Afri- African-Americans. So I think... That uh, is uh, said to, to count towards the five million, mm-hmm. and then this seven hundred thousand will count. But we, we still have a long way to go. A long way to go. And, and then there's all these other neighborhoods who, who have been affected, which I know that um, yeah, you know a lot about. Yeah, I mean, you can't. The, the more the more and more I read about Athens history, uh, especially there at the mid century, the mid twentieth century. I mean, you can't swing a dead cat without hitting a neighborhood that was a black neighborhood that was abused by white Athens during those many decades. So I don't know how many millions uh, you know, in total it's going to be when, when this is all said and done, but I'm, I'm just really glad that Athens is making an effort because you know, most communities really aren't. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. This is fantastic. I have no complaints with it. It's just that we are, you know, we are embarking on hopefully a, a longer and larger project of, of repairing the damage, but this is a fantastic first start. So the last thing I have is about a local road safety plan. Uh, So ACC Transportation and Public Works is developing a plan to improve safety on our roadways here in Athens. Their vision is to reduce traffic fatalities all the way down to zero every year. It's quite ambitious. 
As reported in the flagpole, Athens had more than 50,000 car crashes from 2013 to 2022, with 121 people being killed. And these numbers are increasing. We had 21 people killed on our roads last year, just under the record of 23 people killed in 2021. So what can we do about it? We can make more protected bike lanes, like we have on Prince. We can build more sidewalks, we can slow down traffic, and we can increase enforcement of DUI and distracted driving laws. Please don't look at your cell phone while driving. And we can improve our intersections because that's where 75% of accidents happen. And one way we can do that is to turn these intersections into roundabouts. And that's exactly what they're planning to do right now on Chase Street. North Chase might be getting two roundabouts for getting on and off the loop, and then a third one at the intersection with Oneida Street over there near Tlaylock. Roundabouts are so much safer than intersections because they basically eliminate T-bone-type crashes, which are extremely deadly. Roundabouts reduce fatalities by 90% and crashes by 37%, according to the Federal Highway Administration. The crashes that do still happen on roundabouts are usually at low speeds, and they're mostly minor. But is Athens ready for three roundabouts in a row, Matt? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that's going to be a lot. There's going to be complaining. Uh, But I I know uh, for a fact that people who live on that stretch of Chase or or across the the tracks on Chase are very happy. Uh, Mm -hmm. I spoke to a, a friend of mine who has a young child. They live right past the bridge. On Chase, um, on the town side, yeah, so some Chase. of those cars go pretty fast. Oh, they're hauling ass, and and that's a, it's sort of a blind hill. That bridge forms something of a of a blind hill, and so they're hauling up that hill, and you have a, no reaction time. And so they are uh, the folks who live on that stretch of Chase uh, seem to be overjoyed that something is Good. finally being done because they they feel that they're going to see benefits from that, even though they're some distance from the interchange at the loop and even Oneida, that will do a lot to slow the traffic by the time they get to that residential part of Chase, which will, if they have, you know, if they have their way would be modified eventually for bike lanes and and better sidewalks and stuff like that. And, you know, sort of re reconsidered. Yeah, and I hope the drivers uh, feel the same way or at least don't complain too much so this thing can actually get passed. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I think I think we need to get used to these roundabouts and traffic circles here in town. I yeah, mean, they're, they're here to stay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, once the once the 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 queen roundabout comes and whenever that's going to be 20 I don't have a date on that, but wait, 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 the West Broad. Oh, West Broad, yeah. I mean, that yeah. sucker is going to be massive. <laughs> We're going to get more and more comfortable, I hope, with these. I I I, I'm fine with them. I, I mean, how do you feel? You're, well, you're, you're oh, more of a cyclist. Belts. Are you more of a cyclist or a, or a driver? Um, I'm about 50, 50, but yeah, I tr- try to cycle if I can. The, they're, they're, they're fine. You, you never have to stop. It's glorious. I mean, the, the throughput on roundabouts is actually really good, better than intersections even, but it does slow everyone down a little bit mm-hmm. and no one comes to a complete stop. But but it slows everyone down just enough that it makes it safer. So yeah, I, I like them a lot. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a just from the driving experience perspective, I think there's a mental thing that happens when you hit when one of these intersections that cycles through three red lights before you get to pass through. Mm-hmm. Whereas the traffic circle, even if it takes you some time, it at least gives you a feeling of continuing to move well because you yeah. are continuing yeah. to move instead yeah, just of just sl- that you're, you're slowly inching your way in yeah the, through the thing yeah so i think i think just psychologically to me at least it feels better than a super congested stoplight yeah and, and they're low tech i mean they they work during uh blackouts which uh, it's a small thing but i sort of like that that's a very good point you know i'd never considered that yeah right yeah it's just a it's a circle mm-hmm. yeah le- less electricity i mean no electricity yeah used. yeah you can put art in the middle of them like They're great. We will be back again after the next voting session at City Hall to keep y'all updated on what went down there. And we'll be bringing y'all any updates on news we covered here today. Again, be sure to subscribe to AthCast wherever you're listening to be alerted as soon as the next episode drops. Y'all stay safe out there.